Welcome to Salisbury University on the Air, a program highlighting the activities and the people of the campus. I'm your host, Susan Purnell. While the Salisbury University we know today boasts incredible programs across all disciplines, offering opportunities for students no matter their career goals, SU began as a teacher's college producing many of Maryland's educators over the past 96 years. Today, the Samuel W. and Maryland C. Seidel School of Education at Salisbury University continues to provide some of the best opportunities for future teachers, and their journey connects SU with the community long before graduation. Joining me to discuss some of these connections is Dr. Lori Henry, Dean of the Seidel School. Thank you for being here with us today, Lori. Well, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Now, I said a little earlier that SU has had an education program since its inception. Yes. But the Seidel School was not actually endowed until 1997. Can you tell us a little bit about the Seidels and their relationship to the college? Samuel um, Seidel and his wife, Marilyn, um, lived here in Salisbury. Um, Sam Seidel was a local business owner and he was a civic leader. And in 1984, he joined the um, board of the SU Foundation and eventually became president of that board. And in his time as president on the board, he um, was able to bring the foundation account from $200,000 up to over $17 million. And so he was truly dedicated to um, Salisbury University. His wife, Marilyn, was a, a retired operating room nurse and was dedicated to the nursing profession. Um, they wanted to really focus on giving back to uh, Salisbury University, and so they endowed the School of Education. He was committed to SU and mm -hmm. um, established the endowment for the Seidel School, mm -hmm. um, to name it, and um, also established scholarships for education majors and uh, nursing majors in his wife's name. So, but he had not been a teacher at all, right? He but he still just appreciated teachers enough to do this. Yes, in fact, he's, he's been heard saying before he passed that it was really important for him, the main goal of the endowment was to get good people into teaching. I remember he was a coach, though, and so I guess he was a teacher in, in some form, <laughs> yeah, right? Certainly before my time. They were great people. <laughs> he was a friend of my dad's. Mm -hmm. um, and SU's future educators have always worked with school-aged children um, while getting their education. Mm -hmm. This is not new. But for a long time, they worked here right on campus in what they right. called Carruthers Elementary or Campus Elementary or Campus Demonstration School. Right. I went there from kindergarten through sixth grade, and it was mm -hmm. amazing. And then I don't know when it ceased being, and they started to put the student teachers out into the public school system. Tell me a little bit about that evolution. Sure, absolutely. So a lot of schools that started as teacher colleges mm -hmm. um, had those lab schools, as we call them, mm -hmm. on their campuses. Um, they have gone away over the years. One of the reasons why they've gone away is because we really want our students, our teacher candidates, to be trained in the local context. Mm -hmm. um, our, our districts are so um, wide and varied um, between the districts, even just here on the um, Eastern Shore. And the context of the local community school is different, um, even within one district. And so really providing the opportunity for our teacher candidates mm -hmm. to learn shoulder to shoulder with those classroom teachers within the context of the, the children that they will serve when they become teachers. Right. And, and truly, it was a very uh, homogeneous group of children, Correct. the same 25 children from K to six, you know, that got in at birth. And so I can see where it wasn't representative. That, right. That's probably very true. Um, one of the biggest ways that the Seidel students do interact with the community is through what they call the PDS program. Can mm -hmm. you explain what that is? Sure, PDS stands for Professional Development School. And it's actually a national model um, for mm -hmm. training teachers. Mm -hmm. um, there is a national association for professional development schools. And we are a four-time award-winning um, partner with um, our partner districts. Uh -huh. um, the professional development model is a really rich um, model for teacher training. Um, it provides opportunities for our teacher candidates at kind of every stage of their program from their first semesters all the way through to their full-time internship or student teaching to be in a building together. And so you see those early um, teacher candidates are seeing what, what they can expect several months mm -hmm. and uh, semesters down the road um, working shoulder to shoulder with that mentor teacher. And so it's a way that we can really infuse ourselves into a school to make a huge difference for the children that we serve. 
And then also part of that professional development model is kind of a, um, a reciprocal relationship. So not only are, are the schools supporting our teacher candidates and helping train them, but we're also getting our expert faculty into the classrooms working with their classroom teachers. And so, for example, we have a faculty member right now working with Pemberton Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And so he has teacher candidates who are being trained in um, culturally responsive pedagogy, what we call our science of teaching, mm -hmm. and um, learning how to um, have instructional practices within the classroom that meets the needs of all of the children, regardless of their cultural background or identity. And so he's working with the classroom teachers as well as our teacher candidates in that model for a really rich professional learning opportunity. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful synergy. And, and I can see how you couldn't do that just with a little lab school. That's correct. Absolutely. Uh, how important is it for a teacher to have that experience in the classroom before they become a teacher? Oh, it's, it's critical. It's critical to the learning process. You know, being able to um, work shoulder to shoulder with practicing teachers who are experts in, in, their, um, in their teaching, in their craft, mm -hmm. um, having the opportunity to really be infused within the school community as well. Um, as, as I'm sure you know, um, teaching um, is a lot beyond the classroom as well. Teachers wear a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. um, they're meeting with parents and family members. They're part of that school culture, so they're, they're attending athletic and sporting events. Um, they're helping with field days, back to school night. So really getting a, a real flavor of what it is to be embedded in a local school. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're really learning about all of the other um, aspects of teaching, including all of the other um, support services that are provided to the children, right? So we have guidance counselors and social workers mm -hmm. and um, you know, school nurses, and they're really learning how that whole process works to make sure that they know um, what services are available for the children. Well, I was a student teacher. I, I was a music education major, and I can tell you, um, many of my other um, associates or students that were going through the same program became student teachers and quit. Like, mm -hmm. said, nope, that's it. I can't do it. Because it's the hardest job in the world. It sure is. I really <laughs> believe that. I mean, I, it's the hardest job I ever had. Mm -hmm. And I so admire teachers that are in there every day, all day long, and take it home as well. Mm -hmm. um, we're real excited to see all the students back on uh, campus mm -hmm. after COVID. And I know it's not exactly after COVID, but we certainly hopefully are past the worst of it. Right. Um, but what did they do during COVID within this, the parameters of the, uh, what do you call it, the PDS programs? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, so it was, I think, doubly hard for our, our teacher think. candidates and our classroom teachers, right? So not only were our um, teacher candidates learning to become teachers, but then we had to pivot and shift into that online environment. Right. And so now they were trying to figure out how to learn in a virtual environment themselves and then how to teach in that virtual environment and you know, really thinking about strategies that they had used to engage the children in the classroom weren't working in the online world. And so they had to really, um, really ramp up their skill set and figure out how they could keep those children engaged um, in that online and remote learning environment. And then once the school districts did open up for the teachers to mm -hmm. come back into the buildings, but they were still doing remote instruction, all of our partners welcomed our teacher candidates into that environment as well. And they said that they couldn't imagine reopening their doors without our teacher candidates there. I bet that's true because yeah. they at least are of the age that they've grown up in a technological environment. Right. I, I don't know how some of the older teachers got through. Right. And again, probably with the help of some of your students. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that maybe now, I mean, that was one of the good things that came out of COVID is that mm -hmm. they had the uh, ability to learn to adapt and to use technology in ways they never thought possible before? Yeah, um, I really think that's true. But there, there's another aspect of um, the digital divide that came out so clearly as soon as um, the, the children had to go to remote learning environments. Right, so not all children had a computer available to them at home. Right. Not all households had the internet available mm -hmm. to them. So they really got to see these kind of um, gaps um, with low-income students mm -hmm. um, in particular that didn't have the same kind of access that the higher income students had. And so, you know, the districts did, um, you know, great job trying to get laptops and hotspots into mm -hmm. the homes. 
Um, but as you know, if you have four children at home all trying to learn at the same time on computers and you're trying to work from home, right, the internet broadband just didn't, you know, wasn't there, couldn't right? Handle couldn't it. handle it. Yeah. Um, we had pockets of um, students down in Somerset County, which is one of our um, partner mm -hmm. schools as well. And, um, you know, this, they just don't have broadband um, in Somerset. Yeah, and yeah. so, you know, students were getting packets of uh, materials that they'd pick up on a Monday that would get them through the week. And so the, just the, the gaps in the kind of learning that was happening um, was really, really difficult. One of the things that our um, physical education majors did when they realized all of the, um, the issues around the technology is they partnered with PAC-14 right here and uh, they provided videos of um, physical education. Oh, that's great. Um, well, classes online. Classes online and PAC-14 pushed that out through their broadcast uh -huh. and we created a YouTube channel as well. And so now our teacher candidates are, are continuing with those videos and posting them on YouTube and it just gives them that, another skill set. Uh, so that's great. I mean... It's not great that they had all those things to have to deal with, but they dealt with it. Right. And, you know, even if they were somewhat successful, it was pretty miraculous mm -hmm. given the situation. It's just, right. it's amazing to me. Um, the Seidel School's students also help school-aged children through what is known as the May Literacy Center, which mm -hmm. I think is going through its 30th anniversary this year. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Absolutely. So the May Literacy Center um, had an endowment established um, provided by John and Florence May. And they were really um, focusing on assisting children with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, John suffered from a learning disability himself, and so it was a really important initiative for him. Mm -hmm. um, and so out of that endowment grew the May Literacy Center. And the May Literacy Center is kind of the outreach arm of the Seidel School. And we provide um, tutoring to um, children in kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, working with our teacher candidates right here on they campus. They come here. Right here on campus. Um, Where is it? Four nights a week. It is in um, the ground floor of the Conway Hall. Oh, it is? Okay. It is. It has its own entrance, um, so parents can drop their kids off, and they come in, and they do an hour and 15 minutes of tutoring once a week, working with our teacher candidates. Oh, I had no idea that mm -hmm. that was going on. That's yeah. a terrific service, yeah. particularly right now. Absolutely. Wow. Um, some of your students also worked the summer, Mm -hmm. through what they call the Summer Enrichment Academies. And what's yeah. that all about? Yeah, so we started the Summer Enrichment Academies a few years ago. Um, and these are just um, opportunities for um, youth from our region to come to campus to learn more about SU and then also engage in some academic enrichment activities. And this is a, a collaborative um, across all of our schools. Programming offer everything from performing arts and ceramics to uh, forensic science and STEM and digital media. And oh, gosh. so they are um, like most of them- Like education camp. Yeah, similar, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so um, most of them ran about a week. Um, we also had some programming at our SU Galleries building downtown, which was great to mm -hmm. um, be able to utilize that space for some academic yes. programming. And um, it was just a, a great way to provide opportunities for students who, who, who had been learning remotely <laughs> to right. get back on campus into some face-to-face -face settings. And I'm also sure there was some need for catch-up yeah, with absolutely. a lot of those students. Absolutely. So how did they get selected? So um, it is a, um, a, a program that is, um, has a, a payment attached to it, right? mm -hmm. so, but we did provide scholarships for okay. low-income families. Okay. Um, and so the funding paid for um, them to have lunch here on campus in the Commons building. Mm -hmm. It paid for the instructors, the instructional supplies, as well as teaching assistants um, that were our education majors that uh, provided them an uh, additional opportunity to do some clinical experiences. Fabulous opportunity. Um, another word I mentioned was camp, and mm -hmm. you have another program called Camp, camp. <laughs> which I understand is a program to help migrant worker families get their college education. Is that, that right? That is correct. That okay, is correct. And, and how does that work? Yeah, so the CAMP stands for College Assistance Migrant um, Program, okay. and uh, it is funded through the U.S. Department of Education, and so we have uh, a five-year grant. Uh, Dr. Claudia Burgess is the principal investigator on the grant, and uh, alongside Amber Meyer, Dr. Amber Meyer, um, and uh, we have um, just over $2 million um, over those five years and um, provides us the opportunity to have a program director for the, for the grant, as well as a full-time recruiter. And um, we recruit um, from the, the migrant and seasonal farm worker um, population um, for them to get a college education. 
So they can come here and take all the normal courses. They it's sure not, can. They're not segregated. Nope. It's that's wonderful right. that they right. become a and part of the campus. Yep. And it, it pays um, for their uh, entire first year tuition, room mm -hmm. and board, um, and other support services as well to make sure that they're successful. You know, many of mm -hmm. many of these families, these students, are first generation um, college goers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they need a little bit of uh, extra assistance oh. navigating the, the uh, college um, bureaucracies. <laughs> sure. And, and there may be language barriers yes, as well. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. That, that's an amazing grant. Um, now, being a teacher is also being a leader. And I think that probably teachers have discovered that more in the last couple of years than they ever have before. Mm -hmm. um, you all at, at the Seidel School have a new major called Outdoor Education Leadership. That's correct. Tell me a little bit about that and how that program benefits the Seidel yeah. students. Absolutely, so our Outdoor Education Leadership program was a minor for a number of years, um, almost two decades, and we made it a major a couple of years ago. Um, it's a great program that has leadership at the core, um, really focuses in on some team building skills as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so students can take it as a major, they can still take it as a minor. Uh, provides a lot of um, extra programming for our students in the Seidel School who think that they might want to um, do field, field day events, field trips, um, mm -hmm. adventure uh, learning type activities as a classroom teacher. As you know, teachers wear many hats <laughs> many, <laughs> and, get, and get pulled in a variety of different ways. But it also benefits other students on campus. Um, if they need an elective, they can take a, a creative elective, especially if they like the outdoors. Um, so we have kayaking and canoeing. Um, you can become a certified scuba diver. We have um, really? backpacking, um, wilderness navigation. Uh, when they do the kayaking and canoeing, they're also learning water safety and water rescue. Um, so being in the region that we live in, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for a our perfect students. Perfect region for that, right? Absolutely. To get out. Gosh. Now, I think the perception is that most of the students that graduate from here with an education degree go on and teach elementary school, but that's not the truth, is it? No. You, you go all the way up to high uh, higher education they administration. Uh, tell me about what some of the job opportunities are for a, a graduating senior. Sure, absolutely. So um, from our education programs, mm -hmm. we have programs in early childhood elementary education. So those are the ones that you were just talking about. We also have secondary education programs. So mm -hmm. um, those students who want to become teachers in either middle schools or high schools. Uh, we have physical education. Uh, we have music education. Mm -hmm. And those are K-12 programs. So they can go through a range of different um, classrooms. Um, we have an athletic coaching minor. Um, as you know, a lot of our high school teachers and middle school teachers end up coaching some of the sports at their schools, mm -hmm. so they can do that as a minor. Uh, then we have our graduate programs, and we have graduate programs in curriculum and instruction. We have graduate programs in higher education. We have a doctoral program in literacy. And so- I didn't realize you did. We do. Mm -hmm. And so people can come in um, for a variety of different um, professional growth um, areas, um, change their career ladders. Uh, we do have, with our master's in higher education, uh, a lot of um, people that come in from higher education, um, particularly um, you know, people who want to get a master's to work in kind of the student affairs side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have a faculty member who started in student affairs, did our doctoral degree, and she is now a um, tenure track professor in one of our departments. And so there's a, a lot of variety. It boggles my mind. I mean, really, it does. All of the opportunity, but just all of the different programs that are within that one school that you have. Right. It's, it's, it's a lot to keep up with, yeah, I'm sure. It sure is. Yeah. <laughs> but you do a good job. And well, thank, thank you. you so much for filling us in today on, on all that's going on in the Seidel School during these tumultuous times. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like there's been a lot of adapting and it's been mostly very successful. Yeah. So thank you again for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. After an 18-month project, which included taking a close look at what makes the campus and its people so special, SU recently launched its new brand. While some things like the maroon and gold school colors and Sammy the Seagull will remain, many of the phrases and other branding marks that you've grown accustomed to will be changing. Let's take a look at SU's new efforts encouraging current and prospective students faculty, staff, alumni, and even the greater community members to make tomorrow theirs. What happens when someone believes in you? When someone recognizes your potential, helps you find your passion, and urges you forward? 
momentum begins. Curiosity grows, confidence gets a foothold, and eventually you become unstoppable, pushing boundaries, opening minds, expanding worlds. Here, you breathe in a warm environment full of places and ideas to explore. You embrace your individuality and discover your true purpose. Your views are broadened. You're empowered to succeed. You are transformed and then you transform the world. Community, possibility, change. Salisbury University opens doors to personal growth, dream careers, and new horizons. Take yesterday's experiences and today's opportunities to shape the future. Spark change, make waves, move boldly forward. Make tomorrow yours. Many of the great events we've come to love are back on the SU campus. Let's take a look at what's coming up over the next few weeks.
Education clearly is an important venture. Preparing the next generation to succeed in this noble profession is paramount. And it's amazing to see how SU and its students are connecting with the community through these efforts. I'd like to thank my guests, Dr. Laurie Henry, Dean of the Seidel School of Education. I'm Susan Purnell, and this has been Salisbury University On the Air. Thank you for watching.